I would like to give a warm welcome to our first speaker, who is a co-founder of PipeDrive and a VP of product at PipeDrive, uh, Martin Heng. So please give him a warm welcome. Hello. <laughs> Okay, so Martin, it's great that you uh, could make it here to this special event and you know, uh, tell a little bit more about PipeDrive here to the local guys. So maybe, could you just start a little bit, uh, just briefly about yourself, where are you from, and uh, how did you grow up? Yeah, um, so yeah, hi everyone, I'm Hank. Well, my name is Martin, but since we have uh, 13 Martins working at PyTribe, everyone uh, calls me by my last name. I don't know what happened in Estonia in the 80s, but kind of pretty much every male child was named Martin. So we had four of them in my, um, in my class in, in middle school. So I'm from Estonia. I'm from a really small town called Hapsalo, uh, only 10,000 people. Um, so kind of, yeah, pretty much everyone uh, knew everybody. And uh, kind of that's that's my background, kind of. Uh. And uh, I know that once I look, you know, about your entrepreneurial, you know, journey, uh, you uh, you didn't start with a pipe drive. You actually had some previous, you know, entrepreneurial, uh, inter some experience. So maybe could you tell us a little bit about this? Because uh, if it was successful or uh, it was not. <laughs> so um, early. In uh, in my life, uh, kind of um, in high school already, I started uh, kind of learning programming and then kind of uh, earning my uh, um, kind of basically earning money to buy computer gear uh, by kind of developing websites and stuff like that. And after that, I kept kind of starting companies or at least uh, tried to start companies. And uh, one of the ones that Kind of, uh, we really tried was uh, was a uh, online booking startup in in 2004, I think, with some of uh, some of the friends uh, from college, and um, that's a remarkable story because um, we started it. It was one of the kind of first uh, SaaS startups in Estonia, and uh, kind of on the technology side, it was uh, pretty remarkable. Uh, we were doing all of the uh, modern things like uh, APIs and, uh, and desktop clients, and again, it, was, it was a really cool thing. But on the, uh, on the business side, we failed uh, pretty miserably. So uh, we got to uh, 20 customers, and uh, 10 years later, or now even more later, uh, there's still kind of 20 customers. So, <laughs> so it didn't die, but it became this uh, classic uh, zombie startup that, uh, that kind of didn't grow either. So that was a really good experience, kind of learning a lot. Uh, we made all of the mistakes you could uh, ever make in a startup. Kind of, uh, there's a really long laundry list that we all kind of uh, made. Kind of every every uh, mistake in the book, basically. And then, um, because we ran out of money, everyone kind of left, and uh, and then uh, we started some other things, um, um, which are not very kind of remarkable. And then we started. Uh, I didn't start actually. Um, some some people that I knew started this company called United Dogs and Cats, um, which was a social network for pets. <laughs> Right. So, well, rather for kind of people that are really into dogs or cats. So you could um, make a profile for your pet, uh, upload your pictures of your dogs and your cats, and then can talk to other um, dog people or cat ladies uh, online. And I joined uh, them kind of a year later, and uh, was one of the kind of, uh, leading people there. And that was another really interesting journey of one of the first startups in Estonia that was trying to kind of copy the Silicon Valley model of kind of raising money and then going global and then growing really quickly and doing all of the things kind of right, uh, at the same time doing everything really wrong. And uh, it was successful for a little bit. Uh, we, I think, got to kind of half a million registered users and then went bankrupt in a, in a very public way. and. Um, I was glad I was not uh, uh, the, the chief executive of that company because uh, Ragnar, uh, who later became uh, one of the co-founders of PipeDrive, really got a lot of shit in the Estonian media uh, for kind of not being successful in, the, in a startup. Because at that moment in Estonia, the, the culture um, 
kind of hadn't really gone to a point where kind of people could understand that kind of building startups doesn't always mean that you start a company, you raise money, you become super successful, and then kind of uh, that's history. But most startups actually fail. But that, that hadn't really kind of caught up yet. So uh, yeah, again, we made a lot of mistakes, learned a lot, and um, out of the rubble of United Dogs and Cats, um, you know, three of us, uh, myself, Ragnar, and and, uh, and Tyler, uh, we were kind of three of the five founders of PyDrive. Um, so yeah, <laughs> a lot of failures, a lot of uh, learnings along the way. But would you say that this uh, like. Uh the most important lesson of what you learned, you know, maybe what formed you, you know, <laughs> shaped you to start PipeDrive, some of your entrepreneurial, you know, experience, what is the most important for you? What you learn and after that you was able to start something new. Yeah. So, um, so different learnings from, uh, from each of these uh, startups. So from the booking startup, uh, I learned about the importance of, um, Kind of having a shareholders agreement and uh, vesting. So in 2004, no one in Estonia had ever heard of vesting. Um, so on a raise of hands, who who knows what vesting is? All right. So basically, when you start a company, uh, it's very common uh, in a small company to kind of a group of friends comes together. Like there were uh, five of us, we split the company evenly. Everyone got 20 percent and. Uh, um, it was kind of uh, this way, but we didn't have an agreement about kind of who will put how much effort into this company and uh, how, for how long. So a year later, when we ran out of money, I was the kind of last one standing in that company. Everyone else had left. I was kind of keeping it uh, afloat and making sure that it, uh, uh, that the customers we had, the 20 of them, um, weren't kind of. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, but well. But still, like if you have 20 real companies depending on your service, you don't want to kind of just tell them that yeah, tomorrow I'm going to shut it down and kind of uh, go back to pen and paper, kind of getting your uh, bookings uh, in your calendar. But because we didn't have a shareholders agreement and because we didn't have vesting, and vesting means that people don't just get their shares in the company, but they will get their shares over time, little by little making sure that if they leave on the third day or the third month or the, the first year, then they don't get their entire share of uh, what they should get, but they only get it kind of four years later when they actually have stuck with the company for four years. And that's the kind of usual agreement. So first year you get nothing, and the second year uh, you get 25% of what you will get, and then kind of every day you get a little bit little, and uh, when you hit four years, then you get the entire share uh, that you should have gotten. We had never heard of anything about that, so I was kind of left uh, with a company that I owned 20% of the company and 100% of the responsibility. So that was stupid, right? Um, one of the biggest lessons from uh, from that era. Uh, from the second one, from the uh, from the pet startup, uh, we learned a lot more because we got a lot further. And one of the ones uh, we learned was the importance of hiring. And to this day, uh, PyTrev is slightly obsessed with hiring. Um, slightly is uh, an understatement. So um, <laughs> basically, in that pet startup, we got to maybe a dozen people that were super great. And uh, then we hired someone that wasn't an A player, or wasn't kind of a, a great fit. And uh, you've probably heard the saying that kind of when you hire B players, they will hire C players. Well, we hired someone that um, started hiring F people. Um, and the, uh, the stories, and now, many years later, they sound funny when kind of, you talk about kind of employees uh, kind of, uh, bringing uh, company laptops to a pawn shop and, uh, and kind of, uh, finding a lot of vodka bottles uh, under the table in the office. Back then, it wasn't that funny. <laughs> So we, we learned the uh, importance of really vetting every single person that you hire, not only uh, if they're able to do the job, but also uh, if they actually fit the company and if they're also able to hire other people that fit the company. So today at Pipedrive we have more than 400 people and, uh, and we have kind of gone through some extreme lengths, uh, vetting every single person that uh, has joined the company, and I, I believe, therefore, we have a 
yeah, a much better work environment and, uh, and a functioning company. And the other thing we learned was the importance of vetting your investors. So uh, in the pet company, uh, many of the investors, um, kind of the only criteria was that they had money and they were willing to give us uh, the money, uh, which probably isn't the best idea of kind of uh, qualifying your investors. And um, the result was that they gave us the money and uh, the expectations they had was like completely misaligned with anything uh, we had in mind. So um, that generated a lot of problems. So uh, when we started Pipedrive, uh, another thing that we kept in mind was uh, the importance of uh, really understanding if the investors, first of all, yeah, are they kind of willing to give us money? But uh, even more importantly, are they people that we actually kind of want to spend time with? Um, do we want to hang out with them? Do, do they understand what their business model is? Um, and not only understand, but are they supportive of this business, uh, this business model? Because oftentimes, investors see, oh yeah, that's a cute little company that you have here in Estonia, and that, oh yeah, this SMB thingy, yeah, it's, it's nice that it's growing, but I will give you this money, and then kind of next week you will go into enterprise like every other company. Um, so problems like these, um, they can be kind of um, yeah, prevented <laughs> by, by vetting your investors better. Um, therefore, our fundraising is always much longer and much more complicated and much more painful than uh, for most companies. But at the same time, the results are also uh, so much better because uh, all of our investors are actually, um, first of all, people that we like and want to kind of uh, deal with, but also kind of they have an understanding and uh, a shared vision for the company and the business model. Um, so therefore, yeah, um, it's been much better. And uh, so far, uh, how many investors do you have in a pipe drive? So um, it's difficult to say because uh, we, we have many. <laughs> we have many, uh, and uh, they have kind of a different um, size investment. So in the early days, we raised a lot of kind of rounds. Mm -hmm. uh, in the very beginning, we had a friends, fools, and family round uh, by someone that kind of just believed in the team, and. Um, I still, like every day, I admire uh, his vision. Or may maybe it was kind of yeah, unfounded, but um, like he gave us all of his savings, basically, to start Pipedrive, um, based on just kind of belief in us. Uh, later, we had many uh, angel rounds. Uh, you could call them party rounds, because kind of many smaller investors put a lot of money um, uh, together, so no one had uh, much of an impact. Uh, out of uh, the big VCs, uh, we have Bessemer Venture Partners, and um, Atomico, and, uh, and Insight now. Mm -hmm. So three kind of big, uh, big name VCs in the company. And uh, what is your valuation? If you are right now, you know, in this part uh, with numbers, it's possible to uh, mention? No. <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> I can say that over the eight years, we have raised uh, more than 80 million uh, of funding. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, I just, I'm just curious, how many of you have s some uh, direct experience with pipe drive? Could you just uh, raise your hand? Okay, so uh, maybe could you just uh, really briefly tell, you know, what is pipe drive and what is added value for maybe others? Sure, so uh, pipe drive is a tool for salespeople that are selling something expensive that takes a long time to close. And these uh, salespeople are usually in uh, smaller, medium-sized companies. And I know there should be a way of explaining it um, without taking two minutes, um, but that's the most humane way I, I've learned to kind of explain what we do. Um, you could call it the CRM, uh, some people do, but it's much more kind of focused than just a kind of customer relationship management. It's specifically meant for salespeople, it's specifically meant for salespeople that have a long sales cycle. Usually that means selling something expensive, otherwise it kind of makes no sense to have a long sales cycle. And uh, the main benefit is that kind of, if you have many of these deals going on at the same time, uh, it's easy to lose track of, kind of how far along each of these deals are, what you last spoke about, uh, what the next uh, thing is that you should do with this customer. Um, so if you have kind of, more than 10 deals going on, um, it's really good to have a tool that makes it really visual for you. So you go in and you can immediately understand how far along each of these uh, things are, 
uh, what you last spoke about, uh, what you next have to do with the customer, so that kind of nothing falls through the cracks. You don't forget about any any uh, things that you agreed on, um, any commitments that you took. So basically, it's it's built as a productivity tool for salespeople. And eight years ago, it was kind of revolutionary. Um, it's like everyone else was producing this. Uh, run of a mill, uh, very generic database that you could just use to kind of put data into. Uh, and that was kind of, there, there wasn't any benefit for the salespeople in using the CRM. Because uh, that was just meant for some uh, manager a couple levels up uh, to see what the salespeople were doing and running some report. Uh, but the salespeople just kind of had a, a form to fill out and that was more of a chore uh, than a benefit. Um, PyDrive changed that, kind of made it a uh, productivity tool, actually beneficial for the salesperson uh, to be better at what they're doing, having more control and, and kind of selling more. So that's that's the, the main benefit of PyDrive. How many customers do you have right now? We have more than 75,000 uh, companies all over the world. And the typical customer is some kind of uh, SMB, uh, maybe, I don't know, around 50 employees, uh, 10 people. And sales team, or what is like a typical structure of these guys who would benefit from it? Because uh, from cor for corporations, I don't know if it's for them. Yeah, it's it's not meant for enterprise companies. So it is mostly small or medium-sized uh, companies. Mm -hmm. uh, the sales team is usually less than uh, 10 people, okay. and uh, that's the that's the best fit. But we also have a number of uh, larger customers, some kind of well-known brands that uh, are using PyDrive. Uh, but the, the main focus is uh, on SMBs. Okay. What are your, because you are co-founder, you are a VP of product, so what are your current uh, priorities, you know, which you are, where is your focus right now at Pipedrive on the yeah. global level? Yeah, focus is a, is a word I like a lot. Um, so on one hand, uh, because our goal is to help salespeople keep focus. Um, it's like anything you really do, you need to pay attention. But sales is especially difficult because you need to invite yourself into busy days of other people that kind of don't necessarily want to hear from you. And um, it's really easy to lose focus when you kind of have your fourth or fifth uh, no in a row. Like it's very easy to kind of just uh, slip and then start doing something that is not very productive. So kind of helping salespeople keep their focus is is one of our main goals. Um, and also kind of keeping our own focus on uh, on making sure that we build a software um, that can be described somehow. It's not kind of a universal tool for anything you do, but kind of it's a very sp specific tool uh, meant for salespeople. So in, in both ways, keeping your focus and saying no uh, a lot uh, is, a, is a big part of uh, what I've been doing uh, in Pipetry over the last, I don't know how many years. Um, so what's our... What's our focus on? Mainly, it is to kind of help SMBs succeed. It's like in a small company, if you're selling, if you're successful in sales, you survive. It's it's a matter of life and death, really. I mean, yeah, it's it's overly dramatic, but it's not about kind of uh, increasing something in a in an enterprise by kind of I don't know two uh, percent. It's really about uh, an SMB. Kind of being successful, being able to kind of sell their uh, product and then start growing, or going out of business because you, if you don't sell, you you can't survive. Um, so that's really the goal: helping salespeople be more uh, efficient, helping sales managers to be more efficient, and uh, therefore kind of helping uh, SMBs be more uh, successful. So would you say that uh, these priorities are the you know uh, scaling, get uh, some more market shares to uh, help more, and uh, some customer service, you know, to really know if it's helping, you know, to these customers or not? That this is definitely something uh, important for you as well. Well, yeah, we uh, we definitely see that it is helping customers, and we do see that there's a huge need for it. So if you think of the SMB market, I mean, there's millions, uh, tens of millions of uh, companies, and almost all of them are still managing all of their sales on pen and paper or spreadsheets. So the, the market is just incredibly big. Uh, so the opportunity is huge, uh, kind of helping companies kind of get better at sales, uh, get more efficient, more organized. Uh, and uh, the ones that have migrated to PyDrive, um, we, we see that kind of if there's even a little bit of 
kind of willingness uh, to put some effort into kind of uh, doing sales and then getting better at sales, then uh, they, they do get a lot better. Okay. And so one of the last questions, what is your vision, you know, for you in the next five years with pipe drives, what would you like to achieve? Um, so I, I'm the, uh, I'm the volume guy in the company. So, uh, there are like some, some people that are kind of more interested in, in figuring out how to get the, the most uh, MRR out of all of the customers and kind of uh, figuring out this kind of upgrade path and all of that stuff. Um, I'm the guy that is, uh, is mostly interested in volume. So right now, this kind of 75,000 uh, customers, um, well, on one hand, I'm, I'm super excited about that. And, uh, and it's, it's nice to have so many because, uh, as you heard, uh, one of my earlier companies only had 20. Um, but uh, 75,000 is not nearly enough. Uh, I want to see hundreds of thousands of companies uh, using PipeDrive mm -hmm. and uh, getting more efficient uh, through that. We also have uh, this kind of pretty great ecosystem uh, of kind of more than 100 integrations that have been built uh, against PipeDrive, mm -hmm. um, providing much more value for uh, PipeDrive users. So I, I really want to see that ecosystem growing much bigger and much more uh, kind of successful. And, uh, and in five years, uh, I would like to see kind of new startups launching uh, and utilizing this uh, like real big platform uh, of hundreds of thousands of SMBs uh, and building their startup on top of PipeDrive, kind of uh, providing these uh, plugins and tools and, and add-ons uh, for PipeDrive because then you don't have to figure out your um, your hosting or your billing or any of that stuff. You already have hundreds of thousands of potential customers right there. Um, so uh, yeah, big plans. That's nice. That's great to have big plans. <laughs> and uh, what would you advise uh, as entrepreneur to other entrepreneurs as uh, some key points uh, how to be successful or what is important to have some sort of skills or what is important if you would like to be successful? Jesus Christ. Uh, um, that's a tough one. I'm guessing like, just don't give up. Like whatever shit happens to you, don't give up. <laughs> just like this um, sort of grind. I, I think the grind is a very good uh, name for this uh, thingy. Uh, so when you read the stories, it always seems that yeah, some people were just incredibly successful overnight, and they just came along and they they founded Instagram, and now kind of everyone is a billionaire. Um, and there are yeah, obviously there are some exceptions, uh, but if you kind of dig deeper, you understand that yeah, all of them struggled for ten or fifteen years before that, went through hell and uh, and many times over uh, before they kind of started their kind of SpaceX or Tesla or whatever. So, um, yeah, having this ability to bounce back and kind of uh, get over your stuff and, and kind of keep coming back and keep trying, probably uh, the most important thing. The other one is kind of keep learning, keep an open mind. It's really sad uh, to see people that have stopped learning. And uh, there are so many people that kind of, uh, they reach a point where they uh, say that, yeah, I'm ready. Like, uh, I've been around, so I, I have experience, and uh, kind of, I don't need to learn anymore. Um, so, um, and it's, it's very easy to kind of drop into this uh, um, mode of pattern matching. I, I've done this kind of three times before, so uh, I have all of the answers, and, uh, and I don't need to learn anymore. Um, I really hope I haven't reached that point. And uh, like, if you if you want to be successful, I, I think you can never reach that point, really. Like, uh, like uh, learning from other people, learning from books, learning from kind of whatever you you need to uh, do or get your hands on. Um, that's that's important. Uh, the third one is kind of get along with other people. Um, it's, it's really easy to forget uh, that point. I, I made that mistake like too many times over. Like you believe that yeah, you're on this crusade and you have this kind of uh, goal and I, I need to go and I need to get this done and kind of uh, if you don't get it, then kind of just get out of my way. Um, in the end, it doesn't serve you well. Uh, at least it hasn't served me uh, that well. So kind of, um, I'm not saying that you need, need to kind of 
uh, kiss every ass that comes along, but uh, kind of having a, some level of uh, kind of human decency towards other people that kind of uh, that really helps. Okay, so you are not saying to be like Steve Jobs, only focus, you know, and uh, don't think too much about around the connections with the people. I mean, there are probably like two or three people in the world that can afford that. Kind of being an Elon Musk or being an, uh, a G jo uh, Steve Jobs. Mm -hmm. um, the rest of us actually need to kind of get along with other people and uh, like shit is so difficult these days. Like, if you think of anything, uh, getting anything done requires so many different people coming together. Um, it used to be simple, kind of, I don't know, building a hammer. Kind of be, like, one person could actually build a hammer. Uh, and when I got started uh, in kind of in 2000, one person could actually build something. Today, kind of, like, stuff is getting so complicated, you need a team of people uh, to come together and actually want to work uh, with you and together with you um, doing stuff. So I don't think, yeah, out of the seven and a half billion or whatever, how many people we have on this planet, kind of yeah, only two or three can afford to be an asshole and still be successful. <laughs> and the rest of us actually have to get along. <laughs> yeah, right, that's a good one. So thank you very much, Martin, for right now. And uh, we'll give you time to join us uh, at the end for the Q&A. And now I would like to uh, welcome uh, the other guys, if it's OK. Yeah. <laughs> hey, thank you. Thank you. You can go through here. OK, and uh, I would like to welcome to the stage three other guys. Hi. So, uh, yeah, m maybe you can introduce yourself by round. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hi, my name is Thijs, and I'm a senior product manager for Uber, uh, and I help build out the office that we have in Amsterdam, where we've grown from about 10 people to 700 people in the last four years. Okay, thanks. Hi, my name is Ashwini, and I'm a uh, technical product manager at Facebook, and I work on the ads team uh, in London. I have my own microphone. That's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Maria. Um, I'm from Pipedrive. I'm the head of core product, um, helping my team build a tool that helps uh, salespeople be successful. OK, so great. Welcome here today and uh, since you know this uh, panel is about staying innovative uh, innovative in uh, the you know rapidly growing companies uh, which uh, all of you are uh, a part uh, i would like to ask you what do you think is the most important to stay innovative and keep the startup spirit maybe ladies we'll start sure. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I, so Facebook is not really a startup anymore, so this answer might be a little skewed, but I'll go anyway. Um, so at Facebook, we really believe that uh, innovation is not one team's uh, job. So innovation is really spread out across the company, across every single team, and pretty much across every single role. Um, so we have a really nice culture of uh, democratizing decision making. So if there is a team that has seen some data, there's patterns in data, and has some insights around uh, a problem in the market, uh, they are free to actually go uh, experiment on that. So there's a lot of like uh, teams trying to innovate on different areas that may or may not be part of uh, core Facebook uh, business, and that is encouraged, and so is failure. So the combination of do those two things actually helps us create a lot of new things that uh, were otherwise not part of the plan. Right. Mm -hmm. So a good example would be our uh, recently we built this donation product, right? And uh, the, the, it was literally done by a single engineer that thought that it's a great idea to rally people around uh, donating for a social cause. And uh, what happened is, like, once the, once people started seeing traction in that and their numbers were looking good, we started to like apply a team to that and try to get more and more like market research to understand what else could be done better. So 
uh, essentially like the spirit of innovation is there across the company, although we've grown so big now. Are you using some kind of platform, you know, for sharing these, um, you know, ideas and innovations with other offices around the world? Or uh, or is it li really about some uh, local innovation at place? or? Uh, Yeah, I mean, we use Facebook to actually run Facebook. So in, instead of Slack or other platforms, okay. we actually build our own platform and use that to mm -hmm. uh, share ideas around. And uh, so if you get a bunch of people liking your idea, then you kind of rally a team <laughs> behind it. Uh, and then it starts to become like something uh, that people want to come together and solve for, uh, essentially. Right. So it's not we share a lot we share openly mm -hmm. and that is all the way from leadership all the way to every single like engineer who works on teams data scientists designers no matter what we have a, a sharing culture that allows us to do that mm -hmm. quite openly we're very different from apple and amazon okay <laughs> <laughs> so uh, maria um, so, um, to build up on top of uh, some of what she said, I think that the key is in communication. So, we're in a very different situation than, fa than Facebook, of course. So, when I joined the company, we were four product managers, I believe, a couple of designers, and um, that was about it. And we just, you know, we we're sitting next to each other, and if we had an idea, we just turn our head and discuss it, and, you know, we got it rolling. Now, a team of what was four, six people, it's about 10 times that size. And the challenge is to, uh, you know, just set enough process so that things remain in order, there's no chaos, but so that you don't um, sort of hinder people's inspiration and you don't stop people from sharing ideas. So I think, how do you keep it flowing? Going to your question, um, we're still trying to figure it out, but I think it's about remembering that uh, great ideas will come from anywhere and you have to keep the channels open so that these ideas can flow naturally and can then sort of, you know, be exposed Explored. Okay, makes sense. <laughs> so I think we do three things. Some, some of it is similar to this, and, and uh, I'll add a little bit to it. So definitely the whole idea of, of you want to decentralize decision making is very powerful. Uh, and what that effectively means is that we'll, we, the way we work um, at Uber is that you have teams of about 10 to 15 people who who work together and they have a certain mission, a certain thing that they want to accomplish and achieve. And this team will be built up of engineers and designers and data scientists and operations people and product managers. But the key here is that the team itself has all the people it needs to have to be able to do whatever it wants to do, to be able to be successful. Um, so if they want to add a feature to the rider app or the driver app, they can do it just by themselves. And to be able to do that, we've built up a lot of tools and platforms internally uh, that give individuals the ability to change things in our apps without making, like, without crashing the whole thing. So we have very strong experimentation tools and analytics and just f frameworks and architectures in general that anyone can add any piece of code. It will get reviewed and you can ship it next week. And I think that allows for these ideas that come from anyone um, to very rapidly be uh, built out uh, and put into production, and then you can test it and see how it works. So that's definitely one. You, you want to decentralize that decision making and build frameworks and tools to allow for that to happen. The other one is um, the way that we organize uh, our initiatives is with the objectives and key results framework. I'm not quite sure. Has anyone ever used objectives and key results here? So I see a couple of hands. All right, cool. So the way that, the way that works is at a company level, we'll, we'll, for let's say six months, 12 months, we'll say, we we'll have five objectives, five things that we want to achieve. Um, let's say we want to become a safer form of transport. And then you'll have some metrics that we measure that incidents per million trips, for example. Or we want to become a more efficient company. Uh, and then it's about cost per kilometer, these kind of things. And then that's sort of what the company set, uses to set the overall direction. But then it's up to these teams that I just described, these decentralized teams, to figure out for themselves how they will contribute to this. And that's where you leave these individuals and these teams to just go like, oh, I think I could do X, I could do Y. And 
it long, as long as it aligns with those five overall objectives, then you're free to go do that. Uh, and that's why things can start really small with just a couple of people and then uh, maybe in just one city. And, and if it works, you will have the data to back it up and you'll be able to roll it out to more countries. Uh, and the third thing that I, that I wanted to add was, um, the thing, what I've noticed very strongly is that, and, and I know this is, you know, we repeat it a lot, but I just see that we forget about it. We forget about actually doing it, which is talk to your customers. Just like literally sit down and ask them what they need. And it's, it's so easy to just come up with something and go like, oh, we'll go build this. Um, but it is really, really hard to actually sit down with a customer, follow them, observe them, and figure out like, okay, what, what is it that you actually need? Because customers usually are very, very different people uh, with different needs and different, different goals in life than you are. Um, at Uber, my team builds products for Egypt and Brazil and Mexico and these uh, uh, drivers uh, in those countries. You know, they have a completely different lifestyle and a completely different uh, uh, goal in life than I might have. Yet, I need to very deeply understand them and I need to need to figure out like, okay, what is it that I can do to make your work and your life more successful? So, actually, talking to customers is something that we that we say a lot but we like generally people skip that step uh, but that's been incredibly powerful for us so we, we do the way that we enforce that is we um, as, and again this each team decides this for themselves but uh, for us is we do a, a research trip to a country every uh, two months so we'll just schedule it in the year and we'll go like okay you know, in February, we'll go to a country and we'll go sit with drivers and we'll go follow them. And then we're going to do the same thing in April. What was the most funny moment during these rides? Mm. I think, ooh, so there's, I mean, so many moments, but the most, so, the, so I'll give you the most impactful one first and then, yeah. and then we'll, so the most impactful one would have been uh, a, a trip and interview that we did in Mexico, where there was a, a, a driver. And the way this works is like, so you have an Uber uh, driver who sits in a car, and then you sit in the, the front passenger seat, right? So you can, you can observe. And then when the, when the trip request comes in and the driver is going to do a trip, uh, the driver will call the rider and will ask if it's okay if there's someone else in the car. So that's, you can do like real life observation. That's a luxury that we have with the type of business that, we're, that we run and the type of customers that we have. Um, so the most imp impactful one would be was this particular driver in Mexico City who, um, he was telling me about his, his work and his days and he was like, oh, you know, I'm driving 12 hours a day, you know, it's, it's really intense. And, um, but then, he, he go, then you ask a little bit more, you go like, okay, but why are you doing this? And he's like, well, you know, before I couldn't work, and my kids couldn't go to school. But now I have this opportunity to make this money that I can even send them to private school. And for that family in Mexico, that was, you know, at that point, you were opening up so many more opportunities for your children that he was just incredibly um, motivated by that. And he's like, this, you, this has, um, this will, this will allow them to be successful in life. And that's why, that's why he was doing that. So I think that that's where, you once you start building for 75,000 customers or millions in our case or tens of millions it's very easy to overlook those very personal stories um funny one okay uh maybe we can that, jump we can, yeah we can jump i think <laughs> you can think about yeah. it <laughs> okay so um since all of you are uh, focused on a product i, I know that uh, some of some of you uh, pick pick uh, some of these uh, sites but uh, what do you think is most important uh, for providing the good product, good valuable product or service from your point? What is most important, me, Maria? Yeah, um, I think um, it's it's on the third point. He said, if you want to to provide a valuable product. Um, you need to understand the problem, and if you don't understand it, you need to go and talk to the people who have and are experiencing this problem. So basically, talk to your customers. Uh, it's um, it's about keeping that customer in mind. It's about uh, 
you know, building that empathy, trying to build context into what situation they are, uh, why is that important for them to solve that problem, what are they after, dig deep into the goals that they're trying to achieve. Um, and if you focus on that, then uh, uh, whatever you build should come from that. Um, and it ties back to, you know, your question around innovation. Um, there's this... Um, uh, this belief that, uh, or, or what be the word, misunderstanding, right? That innovation is about building something shiny and cool that uses the latest technology and stuff. But innovation many times is just about solving uh, a problem that has been there forever in a different way. And to be able to do that, then you have to be digging into the problem and the people that are experiencing the problem all the time. So if you keep that in mind, um, it should be fine. And uh, are you trying to get this feedback from the customers uh, only through the online way, or you are doing some, you know, some direct interviews with the different kind of customers in different countries in um, person? We do everything we can. I mean, we do questionnaires. We visit customers where they work at their offices. Mm -hmm. um, we do phone interviews. We observe how they use the product. Um, there's a million ways to do it. It's always recommended, you know. UX experts will recommend always um, interviews or observing the real thing. But when you can't, there is there's another bunch of tools out there that uh, get you close to that. So. Okay, and uh, Ashwini, about you, uh, you, you mentioned that you, uh, how you are doing it like uh, innovation in in a Facebook, and you talked about the team. So what is your answer regarding today? So uh, what is uh, most important to uh, really bring the most valuable product? I guess that it is customer, obviously, in your way. But maybe it's, there are some other points which we'd like to mention. Yeah, I think our product teams really spend a lot of time just understanding the problem. A lot of other companies I worked with, we didn't spend enough time understanding the problem or the job to be done, right? Like, I really like that framework of what is the job that somebody's trying to get done in the sales scenario, like Hank mentioned, how do we get them to be more productive? Uh, in the uh, advertising case, we, there are businesses who depend on Facebook to actually run their business and reach their customers. So what is that exact job that they need to get done? And essentially spending majority of our product innovation time in understanding, either through data insights, customer research, all the things that Maria mentioned. And then um, identifying what are the best opportunities to actually solve that problem, right? Sometimes you might not, the obvious solution might not be uh, right on your face, but you kind of have to like look around uh, whether there's an alternative method to solve the problem. That You can only do that when you understand the problem really, really well. And that's something that Facebook emphasizes a lot in all our product teams, where um, we, we really make sure that we know what we're solving for and what is the optimal path to actually solve that problem in a very short time, mm -hmm. right? So once we have that, then we can experiment a lot, and then we learn with data and insights, which then makes the product better. So it's sort of this iterative product building and risk taking that has allowed us to scale so well and also like go global, right? Across many countries, uh, these patterns seem to apply pretty well. Mm -hmm. So would you say that right now your focus is only uh, is uh, on these areas? This is uh, where is your main focus right now on these areas of development? Okay. And what would you advise uh, all of you to the you know the product managers with their team around the world? Maybe in a um, few points, what do you think is most important for them uh, in the sense of the leading the team you know of these product enthusiasts within the company? Uh, to like, how, how do you, how are you, like, how do you become a better product manager or yeah. how do you yeah. manage you teams yeah. in yeah. different places? Manage the team? Ah, okay. Um, so that's, so the really, the really interesting thing about a product management role is that usually the people on your team don't report into you. And, and that's a, that's a, it's a very interesting situation because you, um, so it's, it's a matrix organization in a sense. Uh, you know, your engineers on your team will report into an engineering manager. Your data scientists will report into a data science manager. Uh, and the, the effect of that is that you can only convince the team to do something if you have the arguments and if you have the, the conviction and if you can actually give them the examples and the, and the vision that 
the thing that you want to pursue or that you think the team should be pursuing um, is something that they actually will do. Um, and in that sense, the version of a, the, the, product, the product management style that I like best is not a product manager who says like, oh, this is what we're going to do. It's a product manager who creates the uh, environment where the, the team can get all the customer insight and, 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 and feedback and the team together goes like, oh, you know, if that's the problem that exists, then let's figure out a solution. And the product manager is almost just facilitating that. Uh, now, it doesn't always work, right? There, there, will, there will be moments where uh, you, people on your team want to do different things and there's sort of this, there's no one right answer. And uh, in that case, you'll need someone who actually makes that decision. So that would be the product manager. But hopefully in like nine out of 10 cases, it's something where you're just facilitating that whole process. Mm -hmm. Now, um, doing that well, I think is a, a largely depends on you understanding the, uh, the difficulties of each specific role uh, that, that's on your team, right? If you have a lot of empathy for what it is to be an engineer, a software engineer, and you understand what like, are the hard things in software engineering, or if you understand deeply how the design process works, or if you understand how you know, an experiment analysis that the data scientist does, how, how, like, what is a good way of doing it, what is a bad way of doing it, then these people can see that you have a, a level of understanding and respect for the work that they do. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and the more they get that, the easier it's for them to trust you in making certain decisions or in actually guiding the team to get in a certain direction. So facilitation and actually deeply understanding what the other people on your team do and what's difficult about their role and respecting that. Okay, about you, Ashwini? Yeah, yeah. to add to that, I think facilitation, there's a really nice analogy that Ken Norton talks about from Google, mm -hmm. uh, where he says product managers are like jazz players uh, and not like orchestra, like not the person who actually runs the orchestra, mm -hmm. mainly because in jazz, uh, it's really like the beauty of that whole performance is that the product manager comes in and improvises, right? So assessing the situation, understanding what the roles are and what impact they might have, and then essentially improvising based on what needs to be done. So uh, every product manager needs to have a very good understanding of all the different roles, how, what is the scenario like, and how can I make, make this performance sort of magical without it being felt. And, and that, I like that analogy a lot, mainly because it speaks to how uh, we need to influence without authority. A lot of the times they don't report to us. Mm -hmm. And um, these are all different people who've done different things. So why would they rally behind your mission, right? So that's why it's so important to kind of get that influence going. Mm -hmm. And, and that will happen once you have the problem identified and one there's a common understanding of why this problem is worth solving. Right? So that's also very critical. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. And Maria? Um, I wish it was an easy <laughs> question to answer, but it's not. Um, I was reflecting a lot while they were answering to it because um, I'm not doing product management with a team for over a year now. And I've, I realized that uh, to be able to succeed in the role that I'm doing, I shouldn't completely disconnect from that. And it's a lot of what they describe, right? Being able to facilitate, being able to get people on board, um, understanding that actually your job will not happen. <laughs> if these people are not on board. It's the people doing the job and you're actually just taking them in the right direction. Uh, but in the role that I'm actually doing right now, I'm actually leading people and they are product managers. And why I find it uh, important to never disconnect from what they actually do is because if I don't understand what they do, it will be very difficult for me to lead them. Um, I think any any sort of uh, leading role, whether you have people reporting to you or not, in the end, it's about people. Um, this is what got me into the role that I'm doing. I care so much about people uh, understanding, not being confused, you know, having clear why the vision is important. Why are we rushing with this? Why do we need to solve this problem? Uh, why do we need to talk to customers? Um, uh, you solve that by actually talking to these people uh, and actually even more importantly, listening to them. Um, so the same work that we have to do with the customers, listen to them, observe them in their environment, uh, you know, trying to build empathy by 
step in on their shoes. You have to do the same thing with the team. You have to listen to them. You have to ask questions. Just be there, be present, be available. But then, and that's why I think it's a very difficult question, um, if you get too bogged down on that, you might forget that even if your job is to solve problems for customers, ultimately, there's a business behind this. And if the problem that you solve doesn't really help the business, then your work is not complete. So you're always quiz in, bet in between, right? Um, based on, on the things um, that I'm focusing on right now, I would say one very important skill for product managers is storytelling. You will absorb the story of the customer and then you'll have to tell it to others in your team so that they understand. You'll absorb the story of what the business wants to achieve and you'll go and tell this to your team to get them on board. You'll absorb the story of the stakeholders and what they want to achieve with the business. And you know, it's just a story everywhere. So you have to be a very good listener. You have to wrap that down in something that makes sense. And then you have to deliver a story that gets people engaged. And I'm not saying I'm actually good at this. I'm trying to figure it out. Uh, but I've observed that people that are really successful in product management at whatever level um, are very good listeners and very good storytellers. And uh, since you are, you know, um, responsible for the product strategy at uh, Pipedrive, uh, is there any specific uh, regarding to your strategy? Is your strategy, for example, in uh, at home in uh, you know uh, Estonia compared to the Czech market? Is there something differences? What is your strategy for the Czech market? Um, we don't have a specific strategy for the Czech market. Um, we're coming after talent. <laughs> I think we think there's great engineers here that can help us uh, continue building the product, and, and that's why we're coming here. Uh, but we do, while listening to our customers, identify patterns, and when these patterns become strong enough, then we might make adaptations to the specific markets. Like, you know, Brazil is one of them, and, or um, or the U.S. But um, we have more or less uh, um, uh, the same strategy for what would be the European market, right? Okay, so thank you very much, all of you guys. And uh, let's uh, welcome to the last session. And after that, we'll uh, grab you know, all of you for the final Q&A. Thank you very much. Heretic, Sergey, Tomas. <laughs> yeah, Let's have a seat. I don't know where is the second one, or do you share it? Oh, okay, okay, okay. So uh, yeah, so our final panel here was the C-level guys with the technical guys. Great. <laughs> so uh, yeah, guys, could you just uh, do a quick introduction to all of you? <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, <laughs> the most senior guy can't figure it out. Uh, okay, so uh, I'm Sergey Nikin, and uh, uh, I work as CTO uh, at PipeDrive at the moment. Uh, I've been with PipeDrive for five years. Before PipeDrive, I actually spent uh, uh, about seven years in Skype, uh, uh, and I've been visiting Prague quite a lot. Okay. Uh, my name is Tomasz Rehos, and I've been at PipeDrive for two months. <laughs> and uh, before that, I spent a lot of time at Skype here, so that's my connection to Estonia. Uh, hi, I'm Radek. I've been working for Skype for 10 years, together with Tomasz. <laughs> <laughs> we actually, I actually joined Skype like two weeks after Tomasz, so uh, we know each other very well. Uh, about uh, one and a half year ago, I left uh, Skype uh, to join uh, the Storios, which is uh, the company that provides a point of sale uh, system for, for gastro places. So. Okay, thank you very much, Jens. And uh, I would like to start with uh, Sergey to ask you why did you decide, you know, to uh, expand, you know, to to Czech Republic, to Prague? Is there anything specific, you know, what, uh, why you decided to go here? Well, I guess everyone expects uh, me to say that uh, there are great engineers, and we did a lot of research and uh, looked at different countries and cities and universities and so on and so forth. 
Uh, fortunately, it has been done before me by Skype. Uh, when they opened, <laughs> they opened an office. Uh, I don't know, like ten years ago. And when was it actually? 2007, so like more than 10 years ago. Tomas was the first employee of Skype, now he's the first employee of PyDrive in here, and Rodek was also one of the first, right? So uh, all this has been done, uh, but uh, I have a story how actually PyDrive ended up in, in uh, Prague or in Czech Republic. Uh, uh, when Microsoft uh, bought Skype, uh, I was actually running a project of integrating Skype into Facebook, and it was uh, coming to an end. And uh, I asked, uh, the, uh, I mean, it was done, finished. Uh, and I, 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 I had uh, an opportunity to choose another project, and uh, one of the projects was to integrate Skype into Windows 8. Uh, also one interesting, challenging project. Uh, uh, but there was one interesting uh, side of that that I had. I was in Tallinn, but uh, all the positions uh, for the developers who would be participating in this were in Prague. So uh, I said, OK, fine, why not? Um, and uh, when I had Miro, I don't know Miro, where, where are you? Uh, Miro. So Miro he's was hiding somewhere, maybe. Yeah, he's hiding. <laughs> so we, this was the guy who was hi like he was hiring for uh, for Skype uh, uh, Prague, and uh, he said, "Okay, Sergey, you need ten developers. Okay, here are three hundred CVs. Pick pick those whom you like. Okay, okay. Um, I picked some, and then come come over, come over. So I came to Prague, and I had like ten hours of interviews on one day, and uh, eight hours of interviews for the second day." And uh, out of those, I think we hired Ferro. Ferro, where are you? Yeah, so we hired Ferro. <laughs> uh, we, we also had some other rounds of interviews, hired some other great guys. Uh, so we had this uh, team uh, who was integrating Skype into Windows 8, and it was actually a great pro project. I think it was very challenging. Uh, we had developers both in Estonia and in, in Prague. Uh, and. Uh, Again, what, what I learned during this project that uh, you have to get people on either one side or the other. So we had uh, a very nice practice of traveling either all Estonian side traveled to Prague one, uh, one month uh, or the other month Prague guys came to, to, to Estonia. And this created a lot of uh, bond between the team. It was a really nice team. And uh, after two years, uh, I decided to leave Microsoft at the time. It wasn't Skype anymore. Uh, PipeDrive came uh, with a proposal, a uh, very nice proposal, 15 people, uh, 10 or 10 developers maybe. Uh, founders uh, went away to California. Uh, so I was kind of uh, hired to run the engineering team. Uh, and when I was leaving, like obviously there was a lot of crying. Uh, <laughs> I, I actually have a video. <laughs> and uh, uh, but uh, after uh, guys uh, come down, Fer asked, "Okay, Sergey, when are you going to open PyDrive uh, office in Prague?" It's like, hmm, okay, interesting. Maybe not 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 so soon, but maybe sometime. So five years later. Here we come. So. <laughs> so would you say that uh, you as well, you know, uh, decided to go to Prague because you knew you have some connections, you know, to the local guys, to some local developers who you thought, yeah, this is something where we could start because, of course, maybe some uh, market potential, but as well that I have this uh, bond, you know, to these uh, developers. Uh, yes, and uh, I, I want to remind uh, what uh, Hank said about hiring. Like we have a very, um, like, like we we choose people with whom we we will work. Mm -hmm. Very important for us, and uh, also in Estonia and, and and here in Prague, I believe that uh, the people who whom you either know you have worked before, uh, or are referred by people whom you trust, mm -hmm. are the best choices uh, we have made. Uh, and uh, it's obviously much easier to to start uh, in the new place where you already have so many great people who either will, would come to work for you or just uh, can refer somebody. And uh, again, like 
It was a coincidence. Uh, we, haven't, uh, we haven't planned to open it so soon. But when I was on vacation in Turkey, I was scrolling uh, LinkedIn and I saw Thomas saying, hey, I'm uh, available. Like, not to me specifically, but uh, just <laughs> on LinkedIn. I said, hmm, hmm, maybe we should do something about this. So I wrote to Thomas and I, at the same moment I also wrote to our CEO saying, hey, there is uh, one guy uh, who is really good available uh, at this moment. And uh, we agreed with Thomas to have a call. And before the call, CEO is writing me, hey, like board approved, we open an office in Prague. It's like, okay, <laughs> that was very fast. <laughs> so sometimes, uh, yeah, uh, such decisions are taken really fast. And uh, it should be—it's supposed to be like the office only for developers. Am I right? Uh, it will be a developing office. Uh, we uh, try to keep uh, uh, product managers uh, and product designers next to the team of developers. So there will be also product uh, people here in the office. Yeah. But, and al also all the facilities like HR and uh, office manager and so on. And uh, your goal is uh, how many people are you uh, planning to hire in the next year? Because I read something about 100 developers in the next year. So this is really some strategy for you? So in one year, uh, one year it's probably hard to hire 100 people. Uh, just again, not because uh, uh, there is no so many people, but uh, because it can actually ruin the culture. We want uh, this team to be strong, uh, have strong uh, bonds together, uh, to make sure that every person is actually uh, good and can be part mm -hmm. of this team. So. Uh, we're probably not going to hire 100 people in one year, but uh, in Estonia we managed to double our orga engineering organization for like four years in a sequence, mm -hmm. like it was 10, 20, 40, 80, and 160. 160 was already hard, mm -hmm. but up to 80 uh, it, it was possible to double our organization in a year, so maybe like three, three four years uh, we'll have 100 people. Okay, so now I would like to ask Radek, who is here like, you know, the professional, external professional, who could maybe comment, you know, on it. So do you think this, uh, that pipe drive has uh, what it takes, you know, to succeed here on the local market with the local competitions, with, you know, uh, yeah, what are your thoughts about it? Yeah, so first of all, I believe that Prague is a great place to open the developing office. Mm -hmm. There is uh, tons of great developers. And also geographically, it's uh, it's a beautiful place because you know if you if you plan to relocate people from all around the world, Prague is the place you want to live, right? Mm -hmm. Not like London or uh, Tallinn. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's it, it is great place to, to 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 work as a developer, and. Uh, I think I think it is a good step because uh, because it is relatively easy to to find and motivate people here to work. The second thought is that uh, PyDrive has a very good uh, like a name in between the developers. You know, mm -hmm. there are some brands that are like not very not very popular between the developers, but PyDrive is one of those that uh, you know if you ask practically any developer if he believes that PyDrive is a good place to work for, I believe that you get a very positive answer. So. If you connect those two uh, those two facts and also like uh, some reasonable strategy and mm -hmm. good good product plan and, and and reasonable way how you want to to lead the, the office, I think that the chances that uh, you will have very good developers are are super high. Okay, and in terms of uh, business, if you can uh, have a look around, you know, for the market with uh, you know CRMs and other softwares. Do you think that uh, it's like an overload here or still, you know, for the customers, it makes sense, you know, to go with pipe drive? Well, I believe for customers, it doesn't matter much where you have the, the, the development office. Mm -hmm. uh, if, it's in, if it's in some reasonable part of work, right? You don't want to open a developing office in India and hoping that uh, the customers will love your product. <laughs> so I believe that the Prague is developed enough that you can build a very solid team. Uh, I, I really don't believe that customers care that much about where you, where you, mm -hmm. where you build it. If, uh, if the, the, the product team is, uh, is very solid and, and smart mm -hmm. and has a clear vision, which uh, in Pipe Drive I believe they, they have. Mm -hmm. you know, they don't try to focus on everyone. They don't try to you know, go after huge corporations. They don't try to have any deal, uh, every deal they, they, they can. Mm -hmm. But uh, they have very strong focus. That's, that's what that I liked a lot uh, as well. 
So, uh, so yes, I believe I mm -hmm. believe there are good chances that the team here will be very successful. Okay. Ma yeah, ma maybe on. I would add one thing. Uh, thank you for hel helping me selling <laughs> my brave. You did a really good job. Uh, but I, I, I would make one thing clear. Uh, if, un unless unless uh, you have uh, a lot of people from Skype in your social networks, I don't think that many developers know Pipedrive actually in Czech Republic. So it's my job <laughs> to make it known and <laughs> to actually uh, tell people what are what are the values and what are what are the benefits of uh, Pipedrive as an employer. So I'm just adding one, one more thing. But Pipedrive is also, to my thing, it's also a good size company, right? It's not a corporation. Mm -hmm. But it's also it's not also not like very small startup where you know you fight for a living like practically every month. So I think that's that's for people that you know are maybe not ready for a huge corporation or uh, are ready to, to leave the huge corporation. So that can that can be a good place to go so and if they are not not willing to risk with some super small startup. So you think that they really are able you know to retain that, st that startup spirit you know and this uh, culture to. Uh, really cooperate in the smaller teams and not in the large, you know, teams where it's uh, not so easy. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, Tomáš, uh, what is your strategy here, here in Prague? Since you are like the engineering and the local guy for the local operations, what is your strategy in the next year? Uh, I already mentioned it a little bit. Uh, the, the strategy is to um, show. Uh, what pipe drive is? Many people don't. Who, if you are not in sales, you don't know what pipe drive as a product is. Uh, luckily, we have a lot of a lot of uh, customers already. Uh, when I when I take my pipe drive uh, hoodie, people stop me on the street and say, "Oh, you are from pipe drive. I know you, and I love pipe drive." So it's, it's nice to hear that. But these are salespeople, and sadly, we are not hiring sales <laughs> here yet. Uh, so uh, my 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 main strategy is actually. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> my my main strategy is actually do brand awareness and uh, have people understand what PyDrive is as a product, and especially for developers, also to understand uh, how is our technical stack, uh, what I what is it like to work at PyDrive, and uh, how happy they can be. And do you have some uh, metrics for it? Uh, metrics for happiness. My my metrics is number number of people to join. <laughs> you heard Sergey. I have to hire hundred people. <laughs> That's my and, metric. And uh, for these developers and for your team here in Prague, do you have some metrics? You know, some numbers where you would you like to be? You know, from now on, you know, the next year. What is the state where you would like to go? Uh, we don't, and I think it's a good thing we don't, because we really don't want to rush hiring. Mm -hmm. I want uh, to people come and uh, grow the team at the right pace. Uh, so I, I don't I don't need to be sitting here and uh, have uh, uh, 10, 15 people hired by the end of the year. We will, we will see how many people will actually hire, mm -hmm. uh, and whatever amount we will hire, it will be the right amount. So luckily, I don't I don't have uh, metrics I need to follow. Okay, and uh, what do you think uh, you have regarding, you know, uh, to these uh, potential uh, developers and uh, new colleagues? Uh, what would you like to offer them? You know, if you can compare, I understand you have the smaller teams and interesting projects. So, what would you offer them? Um, Why they should be interested in cooperation with PipeDrive? Yeah, the environment is very competitive, so it's it's very hard to attract developers. Everybody will tell you that. All the question I got all the time was, why why Prague? It's supposedly crowded. There is no room to hire developers here. Of course, there is room. Uh, you just need to give the right value, and uh, it's very easy to give employees good salary, nice office, and kind of fancy fancy environment, uh, but. These days, developers are looking for more. They just want to be able to have some freedom uh, to create. They they just want to live with the product, and whenever whenever they have ideas or they want to participate on ideas of others, they want to have the freedom to do so. So um, this is this is I think the greatest value that we can have on top of what is kind of standard on the market, and. Uh, PipeDrive is currently ongoing great transition inside the engineering team. I think Sergey will be much better to talk about it because he has been at the at the beginning when when this transition has happened. But I think this is the greatest thing we can we can offer. Yeah. So uh, just in general, what what 
PyDrive uh, can offer. And again, it's probably not for everyone. It depends on your personal value, what you, what you actually want to have in your life. Uh, but we are looking for people who actually want to have responsibility because uh, responsibility gives you the power and you can have an impact on, on people's lives. And uh, uh, what we try to do in engineering is to push uh, this re responsibility to each individual uh, developer. Because I was uh, myself a developer and I know what kind of, uh, like, if you have all the ability to do everything yourself, you don't have anyone behind your back or somebody standing in front of you and like checking every, every step, like how much you can do yourself without like uh, needing to prove that you, you can do it or like, uh, so in PyDrive we actually set every process so that uh, each developer can have as much impact as he is able to do, actually. Uh, uh, starting from the continuous uh, deployment where developer uh, any moment can decide that his code is good enough and can go in production and it will be in production in 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, ending with uh, design sessions with product managers uh, going and talking to the customers. So, uh, again, it's not for everyone, uh, but those people who actually want to take this responsibility uh, might consider. Uh, and the transition, uh, what Thomas was talking about, again, it's, it's just uh, and, uh, like we always try to improve the processes and uh, how we organize our work. Uh, so when we started, we said, okay, we want these independent teams who can run in parallel. And uh, when we want to do more things in parallel, we are going to hire a new team uh, and give them this new task or like this new problem to solve. Uh, uh, but at some point, uh, we ended up with 20 small independent teams and uh, this system uh, actually is a bit rigid. Like if you are a developer and end up in one team, it's very hard to move into another team. Or if this, like, you can't even, sometimes if your team is uh, like too small, you can't even go on vacation because you, you would fail your team, right? So we, we decided, okay, let's make these teams a bit bigger. Uh, and then inside the team, uh, there is always, there are two types of work. Uh, one type of work is where you actually have to maintain uh, your components. Like there are bugs, uh, uh, you have to be on call our developers are actually being on call. The, like you build it, you run it, the philosophy we have. Uh, so there is this maintenance job. And then there is this exciting crea like creativity where you're creating new, like, new functionality, solving new problems, creating new components. Uh, this is where everyone is get, gets excited. Maintenance may be not so, so exciting for, for most. Uh, and uh, if you're in a small team, you have to do both all the time, constantly switching. And that means that you can't actually progress with the new features fast enough. So we, we said, okay, let's not switch uh, uh, very frequently. Let's say that if you want to create something new, you join a mission. A mission is, is a problem uh, which uh, we know exist in our customers and we, we set or create a mission, a, a team, small team, which is going to solve this problem, right? Mm -hmm. And you go and focus totally on solving this problem while other guys keep the system running. And then you're coming back from a mission and you for some time keeping the system running and others can go and uh, solve our problems. So this is kind of rotational uh, system uh, which seems to be working really nice uh, and yeah, it's, it's, it's a combination we learned from other companies, uh, from Spotify, from Facebook, from here maps, uh, uh, but adapted it to our, our own kind of situation. Okay, Radek, what do you think about this approach to development, this strategy, you know, this uh, multi-teams and mm -hmm. some base, you know, for the system? What do you think about it? I believe that scaling agile team is the hardest thing in, in development in general because uh, when you start learning about agile and about ways how to develop fast, it sounds kind of understandable and it's relatively easy, right? And if you have a team that's like up to 10, 12, 15 people, 
it is super easy. But then when you realize you need to scale it, no one will tell you how to, how to do it, basically. There are some crazy frameworks, like SAFE, it's one of them. It's like, you know, this is when you want to take Agile and do it the corporate way. I don't believe it works. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the way that PyDrive is using, uh, I believe it can be working. You know, I have no, no practical experience with it. But I believe it can be, it can be uh, helping to to allow people to be motivated, right? Because if, they, if you allow them to, to jump from one work to another, not too quickly, not too, not too often, but uh, when you allow them to, to work on different things, I, can, I think that can be very, very motivating for them. Uh, you know, maintenance work is, is uh, never fun. Uh, some teams, like mine, uh, take the approach that uh, the entire team is actually responsible for, for, for the maintenance. So we rotate the, the DevOps and on-calls uh, through the through the actual team, so every week one developer has the the duty to take care of the of the product. But again, when you scale the team, it's it's much harder, and you need to you need to figure out. I I believe there is no like perfect way how to do this, or no one actually corrected yet, and uh, it's our responsibility, like you know, the companies like us and, and CTOs like us, to to experiment and to, to to look for the better way how to do this. So, uh, do you think that if uh, the companies like you will start being, you know, more agile in this process, is it definitely is good, you know, for the for the whole market here? So, I believe that these days everyone is trying to be agile. You know, from the smallest startup to Microsoft, everyone is trying to be agile. Some companies are good at it, some not. I don't know the best way how to do it. I just know, I, I just can, can see the symptoms. You know, if the developers are happy, if the development cycle is fast, if the developers feel responsible for the, for the product and they are eager to, to you know, fix it and to have the best quality, uh, that, that those are signs of good agile team, right? Mm -hmm. If they are not just following some gun charts or you know, if, if there are no heavy processes, if people communicate a lot, if uh, you talk to customers, you know you, you heard a lot of about uh, you know talking to customers. All these things are, according to me, good signs of you know agile team. But uh, that's not it, right? You can have well agile team, but uh, it, that doesn't ensure the the, the the motivation of the team. That doesn't ensure that the developers are actually happy, or even 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 more that doesn't ensure that the product will be successful. Mm -hmm. So you need to connect all those dots together. Okay, and uh, what is your industry outlook if you could compare like the Czech startup scene with the Estonian or US? What are your thoughts about it in the terms of SaaS, you know, startups? So in Estonia, uh, the market uh, gone crazy because uh, there are multiple uh, very successful startups. Uh, like TransferWise was like maybe two years ahead of pipe drive for many years. Uh, Taxify got 150 million investment this year. Uh, like altogether, there were like 300 million investments only this year happened in Estonia. The same amount was last year. So the job market is just going crazy. And this is also one of the reasons why we decided to open Prague office, because uh, we don't want to compete with this crazy companies uh, just doubling the salaries, which has been happening in Silicon Valley as well, I think still happening. So Estonia kind of becoming a Silicon Valley uh, of Europe, uh, and uh, we, we know it doesn't work. I mean, it's, it's not good for, for companies. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's why we came here. Hopefully we will manage to stay away from this craziness for some time until this uh, uh, scene also become super successful, and then we'll go somewhere else. And uh, sorry, just uh, Sergey, yeah. one more question. Uh, where do you see the biggest difference between uh, you know Estonian startups, you know, because there, there, as you mentioned, you know, some unicorns of Europe, mm -hmm. and the Czech Republic. What, where do you think is the like the the most important difference? I think it's uh, all started with Skype. Uh, where now we see actually not even the second, but the third generation of Skype employees who are either starting a company or joining a company and they small company, but they know how to grow it. 
And this is what contributes to success mm -hmm. because it's not enough to have a good idea. Also, you need to know how to execute or what's, what you would like to, this company to see in five years. And this helps actually companies grow. Uh, in Czech Republic, uh, I think uh, there are people who can do that. I think it's just I uh, need more entrepreneurial kind of uh, spirit. And maybe, like maybe, maybe a couple of uh, uh, bigger successes mm -hmm. that people understand that it actually works, it actually can be mm -hmm. done. Okay, thanks. Uh, if I may add to my point of view here, I think it is really beneficial for Estonia to be so small because it doesn't make sense to start a company and think only about the Estonian market. So by default, all the Estonian startups are thinking globally, which, which, which is very beneficial. Czech Republic is kind of big enough uh, to be a good enough market uh, for some of the startups, which which may make them think too local at the, at the very beginning, and then it may be hard to think globally towards the end. That's, my, mm -hmm. that, that, that's how I see the big, biggest difference, and that's how I, how I explain uh, to myself what, mm -hmm. what, what makes Estonian start, startups much more successful globally. Okay, and uh, regarding because uh, you have experience from the U.S. market as well, so uh, how you would compare uh, the U.S. with this European market? Um, I would say the U.S. market is uh, more developed in a way that uh, developers understand their personal value better than here. I mean, it's catching up clearly in Estonia much faster than here. Um, but I could see developers uh, wanting to participate on the next unicorn. So they, they, they would be seeking for startups and really wanting to work for startups because they would hope that the time invested into that uh, job will pay off uh, uh, much, uh, much better uh, than, than working for well-established companies. I could see that hunger and I would, when I would be interviewing for people into Skype, I would see uh, I would see uh, developers uh, be sp spend being uh, for one year on on one startup and hopping to another. So there would be there would be much more job hopping in a way. Some, sometimes it would be very opportunistic, but sometimes they would try a startup. They would see that the startup didn't work out, and they would go with a different one. So they were they were willing to take much more risks. Mm -hmm. Let's say. Uh, with the, with the hope that uh, it will it will pay off. Uh, so if I if I compare this to let's say the Czech market, I can see that the developers are a little bit more conservative and they like to think better. Before. Okay. <laughs> before before they they join a startup. Um, and uh, yeah, I think at, in a, in a nutshell, this, this is the biggest difference. Younger people. <laughs> or maybe it means I, sh I should stop talking now. Uh, but I think this is this is the biggest difference. Uh, I'll okay. pause here. Thank you, Tomas. And uh, Radek, what are your thoughts about the local market? Well, I'm pretty sure that uh, Estonia is definitely capital of Europe for, for startups. I don't know why, actually. Uh, one of the things that the developers here can learn from developers from, from Estonia is, uh, is the approach. Um, here in Prague, I still can see a lot of developers are, you know, going to the job, turning some hours, earning the money, you know, being friendly and happy for work they do, but still approaching it as a as a work. In in Tallinn, the early years, I I I've been working for for Skype. Everyone was like, you know, totally leaving Skype. There was, you know, people were not doing it for money or for 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 the brand. They were just just living it. And I think that this is something that uh, that we here in Prague need to need to learn, because that's I think that this is the the, the break point when from from very good team you can get awesome team that uh, that uh, will make your product awesome. And that's something that I think that Silicon Valley is slowly losing because thanks to huge competition that's there. And you know, opening a startup in Silicon Valley is the worst idea you could have. Right. Yeah, Skype, no, Skype opened the, the office there, but it wasn't because you know we would have a great developers there. We had some great developers, but it's super hard to attract them. I think it was more about you know if you have an office in, in Silicon Valley, you know you have 
immediately higher value. But uh, you know the, the the competition is is absolutely crazy there, and there is no point in trying to to attract the people there because they are well paid. They worked on on absolutely awesome products. So you know was was the reason to to move right. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, gentlemen. And uh, now, uh, guys, if you could uh, give us some more chairs so we can invite uh, all other guests on the stage. And uh, let's have a look on the uh, Q&A. Thank Okay, so thank you uh, again, all of you, that you came here. So, uh, what is your approach to uh, scaling across uh, EU? Because we are mostly talking about Czech Republic and uh, this market. So, uh, around it, what is your approach? M maybe Sergey? Yeah, m m I think it was the first uh, question at the very beginning, before we even started, so I, I checked the slide. So, uh, well, scaling across you, we, we are pretty well scaled across you. We have Tallinn, we have Tartu, which is in the second... Uh, <laughs> uh, Uber is not driving there. Uh, so Tartu is a university city in, in Estonia. Uh, we have Lisbon, we have Prague, uh, we have London, so I think it's enough for you, right? But I mean, it, in terms of um, offices, but we also have uh, one third of our customers in European Union, so it's, mm -hmm. it's also. So what about Uber? How are you scaling yeah. in you? <laughs> um, so right now uh, we have, so in, in general, we tend to have a lot of offices, but most of those are marketing or operations. So those are fairly small. Uh, think like three people in a certain uh, city. Uh, and then in terms of actual engineering and development offices, um, we, in the EU, uh, we have Amsterdam, which is our largest. Uh, we are in Aarhus, Denmark, uh, Sofia as well. Uh, and uh, we're also in... Um, Tartu? No, not in Tartu. <laughs> um, I guess it's Tallinn as well. Huh. Actually, don't I have? So that's the office I haven't been. To. No, yeah, I think you mixed up. No, in, in Tallinn we have Taxify. Oh, <laughs> see, that's the one. Um, so a couple, uh, <laughs> and then, and then around the world we uh, we also we operate also. So San Francisco is our is our main engineering office. Uh, we're in Seattle, uh, New York City, Toronto, uh, Bangalore, Hyderabad in India. Uh, and since recently, Sao Paulo. Uh, in, I mean, Facebook's everywhere. <laughs> but uh, specifically in terms of offices, we have a very big engineering office in London, uh, which I'm part of. Dublin is huge as well, so London, Dublin. And then we have sales offices pretty much in every city that supports our advertisers with, with everything, sales and support. Yeah. So there is uh, also a fun, fun fact. Uh, uh, when I was working on this Facebook uh, calling uh, project, uh, Philip Su was my counterpart in Facebook, and uh, he then went on and opened a London office. So yes, Yeah, we're expanding pretty heavily, so if any of you want to move to London, <laughs> you're more than welcome. Okay. I, I think to the original question, was like, what is the approach to scaling? Yeah. Like, yes, we have a bunch of different... Uh, offices in, in different places. Uh, what we're looking for is, is there, is there a sort of a, a local ecosystem and, and other companies who are also attracting talented people? Is there a good university there that where, where people are graduating who are interested in this kind of things? Um, but also a really big one that we look at, are people willing to move to that city if we hire them from another country? Uh, and uh, is the is the city itself? Does it provide like good connection? Like, is there an airport that connects to a lot of different places? Is there good education? Is the healthcare system uh, accessible? All these kind of things are really important once we start uh, like seriously hiring people and, and trying to to get them to move there. Yeah. So uh, as you can see, we we took a totally different approach. Like all our offices except London have very poor. Uh, flight connections. <laughs> uh, 
like, well, yeah, Tartu is, is very bad. You have to drive. Like, for, okay, guys, I think we understand yeah, yeah, it. Okay. <laughs> this topic is about Tartu. Just, okay, let's move on. So, uh, what, is, what solutions are planned for account management and customer success? I guess uh, for a pipe drive, absolutely. All right. Um, uh, I don't. I don't think we have any, any any anything specific in the in the um, plans that are addressing these roles. We continue to focus relentlessly on the salesperson, but we do know that a lot of salespeople, as we observe and talk to customers, um, do the whole set of things from prospecting up to account management. So we do pay attention to a lot of this information, and our solutions try to, um, you know fit these problems when they when they're very very common but we don't have like um a straight distinction uh between this role um and i believe it's related to the second question like because uh, right now it's like very clear endpoint so you get the deal and you close it yes. and the question is about you know yeah so so i mean we do know of a lot of customers that use pipe drive for account management and customer success but it's it's not meant for that it's meant for the first um um, sales uh, cycle. Want to add something mm -hmm. to this, Hank? Uh, I, I can add that we actually, as a strategy, we want to cover the whole kind of revenue side of the business of SMB, uh, that includes account management. Uh, it's just haven't got there yet. So maybe, hopefully, we hire these engineers in Prague, and maybe the first 20 won't work on this, but the second 20 will work on account management. Who knows? Okay, maybe uh, do you have some thoughts about Czech Republic for Uber? <laughs> some special solutions, if we are in the terms of it? Um, all right, so I unfortunately can't say anything specific about the Czech Republic. Um, so sorry about that. Uh, but I, th I think the one thing that is something that has been like, really quite interesting about how Uber has approached sort of scaling to different countries and operating in different countries is that we always hire people locally to run our business, right? So we'll, we'll uh, you know, when we went to, uh, uh, Paris was our first international city and we hired a, like a full French team. And then the same, like we did the same in the Czech Republic, we did the same in, in, in any country where we went into. And we give these people the full authority and responsibility to figure out like, what is the service that we want to offer in this market? And that comes back to the tooling and platforms that I described earlier that we build. We not only build those for engineers, uh, but we also build them for our operations people. And that means that they literally have a web tool where they go, go like, okay, I think you know the different like, in the limousine service uh, is like needs to be called black in a lot of countries. That's that's what we call it, or Uber Pop, and uh, I think Select is here as well. Those are you know those names, the pricing how many cars are available, all these things are, are set by the local team. And that's how we've been able to scale to so many different places because you would not be able to figure out what the local market needs if you're sitting with a spreadsheet in San Francisco. Uh, and I think that has been one of the under, uh, underrated and underestimated strengths of Uber, that we've been able to do this in parallel in so many cities with local people. Would you like to add? Something because I uh, saw the uh, official Facebook event, uh, which was made maybe one uh, one week ago here for the local SMBs. So uh, I don't know if you could uh, tell us some sort if there is some interest in terms of the Czech Republic and Facebook yeah. here. So we want to help businesses of all sizes, and uh, SMB is a huge focus for us, and we have over five you know, five to, ten, five to six million advertisers who use Facebook as a primary way of reaching their customers. So that way every country and every region becomes important and helping them realize their true value is what we want them to get to, right? So uh, we allow for local teams to help them achieve that and, and that's there in Czech Republic as well. We have a client council too that we do where we bring our largest and uh, most innovative clients over to talk to other clients and tell them how they use Facebook to reach their audiences. Okay, thanks. Oh, so... <coughs> uh, 
Okay, so maybe second one. It was mentioned that uh, Pipedrive is uh, focused on sales people. How are you planning to empowering sales users with marketing intelligence about their clients? So one of the things we've been seeing lately is the uh, the boundary between sales and marketing uh, blurring more and more every day. So. Uh, Oftentimes, it's really difficult to really understand: uh, is this particular use case a marketing use case or a sales use case? Kind of like uh, email tracking or sending multiple emails at the same time, or kind of uh, automating something about outreach or kind of scheduling uh, a meeting. All of these things can go either way. So um, sometimes it's yeah, it's really difficult to say if it's about sales or, or marketing, and uh, especially in SMBs. It's the same thing. It's the same people kind of just trying to generate revenue and trying to kind of close customers. It doesn't really matter how we call it. But marketing intelligence about the clients, I mean, we have certain things already. Uh, one of the things is uh, smart contact data where you kind of you have an email address where you can gather um, other stuff about that customer quickly uh, with one click. But there are some other things uh, coming that will uh, probably make it uh, a lot more easier in the future, but we also have this uh, kind of habit of not talking about future uh, features before they launch. So kind of uh, watch this space. <laughs> Maybe Mario, if you could uh, take the uh, second one, are your major competitors and how you differentiate your product with them? Who are our major competitors and how we are different? Um, so our biggest competitor is pen and paper. That's the, that's the biggest one. Uh, like millions of, uh, tens of millions of users. Uh, the second biggest competitor uh, are spreadsheets. So that's kind of split between uh, Microsoft Excel and, and Google Sheets. Um, I mean, um, it's pretty easy to see how we're better than Post-it notes, right? <laughs> so we, are much more reliable and the data doesn't get lost and it's kind of uh, organized in a better way. Uh, spreadsheets is a, is a tough one. It's like, uh, it's really easy to get going with sp uh, spreadsheets and they, they don't really kind of slow you down, especially in the beginning. Um, so it's a really tough one. Uh, oftentimes, if people don't like their tool, uh, then they kind of fall back to spreadsheets or, or post-it notes. Uh, so um, yeah, we're kind of really trying hard to kind of be better than spreadsheets. Um, when it comes to kind of more uh, focused competitors, uh, yeah, there's many of them. I think our relentless focus on salespeople and on this kind of segment of uh, people that are kind of closing sales manually and, and kind of going through this uh, complex sales process really gives us an edge. So uh, some people might say that yeah, you're kind of narrowing your potential market and yada yada. Um, I don't. I don't really believe in that. I, I believe in focus, and I believe that there are millions of salespeople, millions of SMBs, and kind of focusing on a segment really gives us an edge and uh, makes us better than any any other competitor that might have kind of fancy stuff and then the free versions of uh, of this and that. But kind of they're kind of good for everything and therefore good for nothing. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, maybe last two questions, and after that, definitely you will have the time to spend more time with uh, all of all of the amazing speakers here. Uh, uh, yeah, th this one, uh, Tomasz, how exactly are you going to raise brand awareness about Pipe Drive? How will you sell open positions? Uh, what do what do skilled developers care most about? So how? <laughs> I guess I'm not supposed to speak any more today. Um, how exactly this is how? Uh, welcome. <laughs> this, this is this is one of our first events. Uh, this is the first event. Um, I think uh, developers um, like to like. We we are mostly interested in developers who want to learn and who want to grow. So meetups is a great way how to meet such developers. So that's that's one type of event that we'll be organizing. The other type uh, are hackathons. Uh, so we will be hosting a hackathon in November here in Prague, uh, focused on uh, mainly third-party developers who are integrating Pipedrive into other tools. 
So that's another type of event. And uh, we will be just active on different kind of conferences and uh, just spreading spreading the PyDrive uh, word. That's that's the main strategy. And in in, ter in terms of what kind of uh, what kind of positions we mentioned that product designers product managers and uh, all different kinds of developers. Uh, our main technical stack is Node.js uh, and uh, React. Uh, we are organized in the microservices architecture. Uh, so I think our technical stack itself is attractive enough for many developers uh, to want to learn more about us. And uh, about, the, yeah, this is about skills, but for me it's all also about soft skills. So really developers who want to um, get better and who want to enjoy the freedom that uh, Sergey Sergei was talking about. Because with freedom comes also responsibility. So it's not for everybody. Um, and um, once, uh, once we kind of spread this message, I'm, I'm sure that it will be much easier uh, to find the right, the right people. Is this work? Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, it doesn't work for me. <laughs> and uh, one of the last, so uh, have any of the scandals your company has been through affected uh, you in any way? Talking about Cambridge Analytica, Kalanick. Yeah, sure. Um. <laughs> he seems eager to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it, it's, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, so, I've, so I've been at Uber for four years. The class is still fine, that's good. I've, I've been at Uber for four years, and so I, I joined when we had about a thousand people, and now we have uh, a, little, a little over 20,000 people. Uh, and in that time, I've, I've seen a lot of change. And obviously, we've had a, a pretty rough year last year. Uh, and what I think has been really a lot of things went wrong, and we've done a lot of things wrong. Uh, and that is, it's, it's painful to go through that. It's painful to, to see that. I think it's also something where you, uh, even if in, in your office of your team, uh, that's the, those things might not have happened, it's, it's obviously incredibly painful to see that it has happened in other places of the company. Uh, and I think what we've done really well is uh, that we've have really taken it as an opportunity to change and to uh, improve. So if we look at our top 20 people, 30 people right now, I would say uh, there's only one. There's like only one person left who uh, is there for longer than like two years. We've we've looked very very seriously at um, the things that have happened and who was responsible for that, and how that responsibility spread throughout the company, and the policies that we used to enforce some of that. And we have very rigorously adjusted that. So for all the bad things that have happened, um, I think it was a, it was a very uh, painful time for us to go through, but we've come out much stronger and better at the end. Uh, and I think uh, the fact that we have a new leadership team is uh, sort of the, the strongest signal uh, for that and, and the most public one. But there's so much under the hood and, and internally that has changed, uh, which is also why I'm, I'm still there. Like that is what makes me optimistic about the place. So uh, it has been a, a very, it, it is a very different company right now uh, for the better. Okay, uh, and the last one, uh, how do you empower SaaS users to make data-driven decisions about their potential clients and uh, what is planned for the future? Who would like to answer it? Sergey. Yeah, so uh, as Martin was saying, the idea was to build a tool which is actually useful for salespeople, right? And uh, when they're using it all, all the day, uh, in and out, uh, they actually generate a lot of data. Uh, and uh, this is different from the tools which are meant for the uh, managers who actually force people to enter the data. They enter the data maybe on Friday evening uh, just to satisfy the requirement from the manager, uh, but this, such data doesn't actually give any insights. 
only the uh, actual usage data uh, gives uh, can give insights and uh, Right now, uh, what we're doing, we have a, a very small uh, but mighty AI team which is actually exploring uh, this data and, and uh, also looking for opportunities to get more data which can, in the future, actually uh, help salespeople to sell better and more efficiently. So this is what we are doing, but it's a really early phase. Uh, uh, we need more customers. We need these customers to use the product more. Uh, that will give us more data which can be used in the future to help salespeople. <laughs> so thank you very much again, guys, for uh, your participation during these discussions and all of you who could be part of it. Right now, we can uh, move for uh, another part, which is uh, to celebrate, you know, discuss, do some networks. Definitely what I mentioned at the beginning, uh, it, yeah, after that. Uh, just one of uh, my colleagues uh, remind me something. But uh, what uh, I would like to say before we'll keep uh, proceed to the next, uh, Many or some other pipe drive guys are coming around with the black shirt with the P letter. So definitely, if you would like to ask about anything, because you have the pro from the different backgrounds, different professions, definitely you can ask them about uh, maybe some potential jobs. I don't know, whatever. <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, I don't know. Would you like to add something, Thomas, right now? Because we are co-organizing all this event. So would you like to add something? Yeah, make sure that you stay, you network with us, and you eat all the food, because there's a lot of food. So <laughs> don't go home yet. OK, so thank you very much. All of you guys. And uh, we would like to just, uh, yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs>